Your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Blessed be, heed the words I call to thee. Honor the old ones in name and deed. Hearken not to others' greed. Pray to the moon when she is round. Luck with you shall then abound. Respect the earth, the sky, the sea. As you will it, so mote it be. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron on the Para X Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet and welcome everybody, and it's time to stir the cauldron again. And for those of you who are new to this show, like the guy said, I'm Marla Brooks, and thank you for joining us tonight. And for those of you who are regular listeners, thank you as well for coming back. Now, I've been looking forward to this show for a long time, and it's the music that you just heard was a goddess chant, and that's what tonight's show is all about. We're going to be talking to one of my favorite people, Nicholas Pearson, about his long-awaited book, Stones of the Goddess, Crystals for the Divine Feminine. Now, Nicholas has been immersed in all aspects of the mineral kingdom for more than 20 years. Um, He began teaching crystal workshops in high school, later studying mineral science at Stetson University while pursuing a degree in music. He worked for several years at the Gillespie Museum, home to the largest mineral collection in the United States. And um, he's also a certified teacher and practitioner of Usui Reiki Ryo, (laughs) and he teaches crystal and Reiki classes throughout the United States, and it's a pleasure having him back to talk about the new book. So welcome back, Nicholas. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. I think think I've been waiting for this interview for months now. I'm glad we're together again. Oh, yeah, we are. This is good. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) And and you know what? The first thing I noticed when the book arrived was how heavy it was. And, you know, looks are deceiving. And at first I thought it was just me getting weak or something. But then a friend was here visiting the other day, and she picked it up. And the first thing she said was, oh, my God, this is so heavy. And, it you know, it doesn't look a whole lot bigger than all your other books, but there are nearly 500 pages. And that surprised me. <laughs> 
yeah, it was quite the labor to to write and have illustrated and edit, especially that editing bit. Um, the, it turns out the more words there are, the more editing you do. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it's scary, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But it, it's 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 amazingly compact, you know, and it just it, it fools the eye. Um, not that anybody's going to get a hernia, mind you, but still, you know, it's just one of those things that are just oh, okay, good. It's not me. Now, in the book, um, you explore a hundred or so gemstones and crystals that are strongly connected with the divine feminine, and I'm sure lots of people have heard the term, but they don't exactly know what it means. And maybe everybody's definition might vary to some degree, but how would you define divine feminine? I think that's a really great place to start. You know, the the inspiration for this book is something that probably goes back to my earliest days dabbling in spirituality and I was still kind of figuring myself out and um, I'd never been raised in a particularly religious household which gave me some some freedom in how I wanted to explore divinity and religious practice and spiritual thinking and the idea of God as being this you know old white dude with a beard in the sky never did it for me Um, you know old white dudes with beards are wonderful but that wasn't how I pictured divinity. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it until I was introduced to the idea as, um, you know, the divine feminine. And God is not necessarily singular, depending on how we choose to develop a relationship with divinity. And, you know, the idea of this great mother, this all-encompassing current of, of the goddess, really just spoke to some primal, primitive, long-forgotten part of Nicholas that was suddenly coming out through the woodwork to commune with the Great Mother. So I think I I choose to define the Divine Feminine as the current of divinity that manifests through a feminine polarity. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of points, too, to make in that, because in the first place, people might think, well, um, the Divine Feminine is in only for women. And that's not the case at all, because the concept is we all have masculine and feminine inner energy within us. And, you know, when you honor and connect to the divine feminine, it's an act of worship, and it's a sacred connection to Mother Earth and, and to the very energy of giving, like, birth, but not just to things, but to, um, well, to ideas, to expressions, to dreams, and life and existence. So it's all put together, but I think some people hear it and they just all of a sudden think, oh, that's a girl thing. You know, that's a woman thing, and it's not. Yeah, you know, I, I have to be real transparent. There There is certainly that feeling in the back of my mind, me, a guy, publishing a book about the divine feminine. There's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance there. So um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to be real um, receptive to the fact that there are going to be you know, concepts related to femininity that are outside of my life experience. And so, um, you know, I, I do the best I can to interpret and observe those things. But I'm happy to give up my spot at the table for someone who's got the right voice to, to put that out there. Yeah, well, it's, it's just an amazing concept, and, and it's wonderful. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, the divine feminine, I mean, it is. It, it's, it's very warming, like, a, like nurturing and, and that. So it, it just kind of puts you in the right place. And, you know, it's this thing that it's not gender exclusive. And, and so people hear feminine and they think, well, that's it. But, hey... You know, we've all got both 50-50 down the line. Some of it just is hidden not quite as well as, as others. I mean, I can't, you know, go and punch a guy in the face, but it doesn't mean <laughs> I don't feel like I want to sometimes, you know. So <laughs> there is the masculine side showing up. All right. Well, let's um, let's talk about the connections between the divine feminine and the mineral kingdom. Because you said in the book that these connections continued to pop in your mind more and more over time. And eventually couldn't be ignored, and that was how the book's genesis came to be, right? Yes, it really was. It was just one of those little tiny ideas that wouldn't leave me alone. I, I was even concerned that it because it didn't kind of match the, um, the tone of some of my other books, it might not be at home with my publisher. They, they had very different ideas. They loved it, in fact, <laughs> and encouraged me to you know continue the thread I was working on. Yeah. Um, but, you know... The connection between the idea of Mother Earth and, you know, minerals as cells of her body or as her children, as her emissaries, is something that I think is just a real natural progression. 
Even <laughs> in modern mineral science, we see words like matrix, which comes from the Latin wo- word for womb, or, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about matter, all things that have mass. Um, matter is derived from the Latin word mater, meaning mother. So we have in, in these terms that relate to you know, solid form and the mineral kingdom itself, words that are expressions of the divine feminine. We're kind of divorced from that. Most of us today don't speak Latin. Um, I sure don't. But the, the DNA of it is still there, this idea of the great mother as our, our planet incarnate, as the cosmos incarnate, is still alive and well. And it just kind of takes um, a different set of ears to sort of tune out the noise and listen, find that stillness, and you can still hear her speak no matter where you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, since, you know, the book is Stones for the Goddess, let's delve into the goddess aspect. And I'm going to be jumping around here. I'm just going to, you know, put it out there. So we may be going back and forth for stuff, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, but, all right, uh, talking about the goddess aspect, I mean, historically, she's been worshipped since, well, forever. And you speak of the great goddess in the book. Now, that sent my brain on a slight journey because I began to wonder which sometimes can be scary. Um, But here's what popped into my head. When we speak of God, I believe there's one supreme being. That's my belief system. And Mm -hmm. he's recognized by many different names, um, depending on ethnicity, religion, and personal belief systems. So does that apply to the great goddess as well? As in, um, to some people, the great goddess may be the Virgin Mary or perhaps Isis or any other number of deities? So to, to answer this question in a, in a way that's going to satisfy, I think, all parties, we have to look at uh, a couple different ways of defining the all. My, my personal belief is kind of a, an amalgamation of, of more than one of these ideas. But we have the idea of um, polytheism, a belief in more than one God. Mm-hmm. And there are hard polytheists who really believe wholeheartedly that, you know, Hermes and Zeus and Odin and any other divinity you want are as as discrete and separate human as human beings. And then soft polytheists maybe could be summed up with the expression that comes from Dion Fortune: um, "All gods are one god, all goddesses are one goddess, and there is but one great initiator." Mm-hmm. Um, and they kind of view these as emanations of source. And, you know, in truth, I believe the gods really are as separate as you and me. So, mm-hmm. ding, 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 Nicholas is a hard polytheist, right? Well, if we're all first ideas in the mind of source, of creator, the heart, mind of all that is in the cosmos, and an idea can never truly leave its source, then how can we truly be separate from source or one another? And I think that's true of our gods as well. So, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle there. Um, but if we talk about the great goddess, I think that is a a way to conceive of the fact that there is some current of energy here that is too big for our our tiny little human minds to wrap themselves around. Um, Divinity itself is above and beyond the gender binary. You know, I I hope to one day have a couple follow-up books to this one, Stones of the God and Stones of the Divine Androgyne, where we Mm. talk about the things that don't fit into these, you know, perfect little categories of masculine and feminine divinity. Mm -hmm. Um, but since those are such big things, we break them down into smaller and smaller pieces. I think probably the very first conception of divinity ever was um, creator as mother. And you know mm-hmm. that specialized over time. People got in touch with the spirits of the land, the spirits of weather, the spirits of stone, of creature, of plant. And some of those maybe took on more divine characteristics. Um, some of them might have kind of merged with ancestral memories and so specific gods and goddesses were born out of those sorts of experiential relationships with divinity rather than just, you know, someone wrote a book and we believe everything in the book now. Right, yeah. Well, books are, you know, completely, well, depends on where. It's like Wikipedia. Everything in Wikipedia <laughs> is right, right? Yeah. Right, of course. And depending on the author, um, you know, that goes for books too. <laughs> um all right. Now, in the, in the book, you also delve into the many facets of the archetypes of the goddess, as in she is the earth mother, she's the maiden, she's the uh, maiden mother crone, she's the mistress of magic, the queen of heaven, and on and on. And that that 
really interested me, and it was it, there were a lot of really good, helpful explanations um, in that little bit. Because I mean, I, there is so much to tell, and it's hard to get it all out. But you're doing a great job. Thank you. You know, I my my brain still kind of believes it belongs to academia sometimes, and I like to label <laughs> and break things down. <laughs> Um, you know, you can take the guy out of academia, but you can't take that out of me. So mm-hmm. um, it's really hard to take these these complex figures from the the histories, the mythologies, the religions of the world, and try to fit them into discrete little boxes. I tried to do it anyway, but I totally accept the fact that if you look at, you know, a goddess like um, Ishtar, for example, mm-hmm. she is definitely. Uh, a queen of heaven. She's also a mistress of magic. She could, in some ways, be the earth mother, as well as the goddess of love and beauty. She could be the fierce goddess, because she rules over war and destruction, too. So, um, with any of our ideas of the divine feminine, the, the, the archetypes that are in this book represent roles that they have played. It's not to say the gods are only archetypes. You know, we're not trying to get into Jungian psychology and reinterpret myth through that lens. But archetypes are like the the perfected forms, the patterns that exist for things. And so, obviously, if if we relate to specific archetypes, then so does our our idea of divinity. And we can better tap into them through these specific archetypes. And since the book is about crystals, there are, there are stones that correspond with them. So, you know, if you want to connect with any particular goddess of hearth and home, then you might choose a stone that relates to that energy of hearth and home. And so, there'll be a list of them there in the book for you. There are. <laughs> now, the book is broken down into three parts. Part one is crystal basics. Um, part two focuses on the signific- significance of the divine feminine. And part three is a compendium of crystals. And it's an amazing compilation. Um, and as much as I hate putting it this way, because there will be a considerable, considerable amount of eye rolling as soon as the words leave my mouth, it seems <laughs> that in writing this book, you left no stone unturned. <laughs> you know, um, at the end of the day, you have to call a book done, whether it really is. Um, you know, you, you have to f- hit send for the final time on the draft that you send into the editor before it gets published. So there definitely are things I wish had made it into the book that did not, but that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, it, it, it would be impossible to have every single reference to the Divine Feminine through the lens of the Mineral Kingdom. Um, you know, just, just a couple weeks ago, it occurred to me that Rhoda Crozite never made it to the book, and that would have been a great one. So maybe one day there'll be a, a follow-up, even more Stones of the Goddess. Well, and there probably are. And, and I mean, all right, if you think about it, how many gods and goddesses are, well, let's go with just goddesses. How many goddesses are out there? I mean, there are an innumerable amount. I don't think anybody's ever counted them, but... There are tons and tons, and, you know, each one has their own specific traits, and and there always are crystals and stones that will match them. For sure. So, yeah, you could write, you know, you could do a whole, like, encyclopedia with, you know, 12 volumes on that, (laughs) and probably still leave something out. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, did you... When you started doing the book, did you plan on adding as many stones and crystals as you have, or did they just kind of keep popping up in your head and insisted, insisting on being heard? You know, I really didn't have uh, a clear goal in mind when I first started working on the project. It was really just jotting some notes down. Those notes eventually kind of came together to become the appendix, um, the table mm-hmm. of correspondence in the back of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's where all the writing was in the very beginning, plus uh, a rough outline, a sketch of what I think I wanted to include, kind of grouped by theme. Some of those themes became um, whole chapters. Some of them kind of just represented ideas I want to talk about throughout the book. But it was just a handful of notes so I could get them out of my head and onto paper and then move on to all the other things I was working on. But um, I didn't have an objective for how many stones or necessarily which ones in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, I let them kind of choose themselves. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the litmus tests was, um, you know, I, I wanted to include some brand new things that relate to the sort of emerging goddess energy that we're experiencing in, in the world now. But mm-hmm. I also wanted to cover our basics with stones that are related to 
um, you know, more classical streams of, of magic and mythology and witchcraft that have those connections to the Great Mother. Yeah, you did a great job. And, and well, let me, and we're talking about all the things in the back of the book, all the crystals, but there's also minerals in the back. Um, mm-hmm. So for each entry, you kind of include um, a reference to myth and mineral science and offer suggestions on how to include them into our personal practices. Um, and, and let me just, just open the book for a second. Let me look at copper because just for, as an example, um, the magical uses are for love, for healing, for wealth, connection, love, or luck, and attraction. And the elemental signature, water and earth. Um, astrological signature is Venus, the sun, rarely. Taurus, Libra, Virgo, Sagittarius. And then the goddess archetypes, the goddess of love. The Earth Mother, Sacred Harvest, um, Queen of Heaven, and Fierce Goddess. And then the formation process is ingenious, what, native, yeah, native copper, sedimentary, copper ores, or metamorphic, which is copper pseudo, oh boy, pseudomorphs. <laughs> Got me good there. But, yeah. I mean, but you do that for each each stone and mineral and, and everything. And then there are just like pages of. Um, of information that follow before you go to the next one. So, I mean, there, there, I don't know how you can even think that there's not enough here to keep anybody happy um, <laughs> because it just goes on and on and, and it's lovely. And, you know, cause some people don't think of minerals as being part of all this, you know, um, but minerals maybe even came before stones. Is that a fair stupid guess or what i mean well you know i think um it's helpful if we kind of break down some terms so you know we we define a mineral as any inorganic naturally occurring solid substance with a a um, crystalline structure so it's a periodic or repeating structure and a regular composition so all of our rocks and stones are comprised of minerals for the most part there are exceptions to every rule Um, but you know minerals are the building blocks of stones Okay, that oh, so I wasn't too far off. I just didn't didn't say it well enough to make any. That's okay. <laughs> so, so how important do you feel it is for us to work hand in hand with the mineral world, and mineral world being the, the umbrella term for the stones and the crystals as well? I I mean, whether we know it or not, we're working hand in hand with them anyway. Um, you know, I'm I'm talking to you right now via my smartphone. And not only does it have little tiny quartz oscillators in there, but there are silicon, you know, the, the sort of semi-metal in crystalline state. We have all sorts of precious metals refined from mineral ores. Um, the, you know, silica glass that's on the surface. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interacting with you because of the magic of the mineral kingdom. It's just, you know, suitably advanced science that appears to be magic if we didn't know any better, but that doesn't make it any less magical. Um, I'm sure. just sitting here. Um, on the bedroom floor, on my carpet, which is made out of plastics that come from petrochemicals found in, you know, fossiliferous rocks. There's gypsum in the drywall, in the four walls around me. There's copper wiring that allows me to have electricity, which is refined from copper ore minerals. So we're always interacting with the mineral kingdom. We just aren't very well aware of it most of the time because it's been so processed and so um, updated to the modern age. Um, that we don't recognize that we're still surrounded by stone at all times. And I think there is great benefit if we start to enter into conscious relationship with the minerals that are already around us, as well as, you know, maybe bringing in some really beautiful ones to use as healing tools or tools for transformation and magic. Um, There's certainly nothing wrong with that either. Mm -mm. No, nothing at all. Um, But, you know, in your explanation about the the elemental and astrological signatures and magical uses and goddess archetypes um, and, and the formation process. Um, it just, you, you've just stuck everything perfectly easily, seemingly easily. I'm sure it wasn't for you to match things up for the right, the right stone, the right gem, the right uh, mineral for each um, goddess and, and, and whatever. And, you know, I mean, I know that because you and I have been secretly working together on a project that will be available <laughs> in the fall. 
And, you know, I've seen firsthand how amazing you are at matching stones and crystals to specific purposes. Good. I think I was cryptic enough in saying it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, even though I'm sworn to secrecy, but I will say that I was blown away at how you not only match the stones to these certain objects that we're talking about in my in our project, that, but you also grab the very essence of the incantations for each of those objects that I had um, and explain the stone's usage along with, along those lines and how to use a stone along with the incantation. And I mean, it was just, you know, when, when I read what you wrote, you know, I could see that you, you it would have been, okay, well, here's the one thing that you need to match a stone to, but then you read the incantation and you worded it, so it just blended in so beautifully. And that's what you're doing in this book. You're making everything kind of blend smoothly and wonderfully and and easily understandable. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, I, I really try to kind of bridge worlds when I do my work, whether it's science and spirituality or the old age and the new um, so that's that's really heartening to know that I'm I'm getting it right at least some of the time. You did. I mean, you know, <laughs> Dinah, or my editor, she went wow, and I was like, yeah, see, you know, it wasn't just me. I mean, it, it's really impressive how that that brain of yours works to be able to do all this stuff, and and you do. Have, I mean, you are like a kind of a walking encyclopedia of this, and you've been at it long enough so that it's probably second nature. But to those of us on the sidelines who who read the books, it's like, you know, it's like in awe of, oh, my God, how does he know that much? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, we, I was going to ask you about the terminology referring to crystals and stones and rock. Um, and there's a big difference between a stone and a rock. I mean, because um, you explain all this with some really <clears throat> helpful definitions and um, again, something that we learn as we're going, you know, some people think that rocks are just kind of like something that, that, you know, just you kick around and everything, you know, it, it's not worthless. And then you say, well, look at a gemstone and they'll say, oh, well, gemstones are pretty, but, you know, they're, they're really nice. But rocks, pleh, you know, I mean, so it's really good that you have all this in there because I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and I won't throw rocks at anybody anymore, and I won't be in a glass house to throw any either. No <laughs> stones, no, no whatever. Um, now, the other thing then, and we talked about this um, during some of the talks in the other books, but I really do want to talk about it again, um, and that's um, talking about your crystal toolbox chapter. Um, you know, we we're talking about choosing stones, we're talking about cleansing stones, dedicating and consecrating, um, and empowerment of stones. And so I think, um, you know, if we can kind of just talk about that, we've got like uh, three or four minutes till the break. And if we can just talk about, um, well, we could start, it probably will run over, but what about the choosing stones in a sense, as far as this book goes, and the deities, the divine feminine, that's that's um, pretty much cut and dry. But people who want to have stones, who, who like stones, talk about choosing them. I mean, sometimes do they choose us or do we, you know, go after them or how does, let's talk about that. You know, I think it works both ways. Um, sometimes we have a stone, we take one look at it and we just know this, <laughs> this stone, this is the stone for me. And, you know, other times we go, hmm. Every crystal description I've ever read in this whole book sounds great, so therefore I need one of each, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of prescriptively that way. Mm -hmm. Other times maybe we, we do some soul searching and we kind of find a, a theme or an idea or a pattern in our life that needs some healing or some transformation, and we try to match a, a tool to support that. Um, ultimately, though, I think the the best thing we can do is just be really conscious about how we're choosing our stones not just in the sense that we're we're present with them as we make the decision but you know try to be conscious of where they come from how they got to us um with with the rate at which mining is taking place and continuing to grow the rate at which you know the crystal craze is you know skyrocketing which is wonderful um mm -hmm. it means that we're putting more strains on mother earth so we got to be as conscientious we we got to try to buy 
as ethically as possible and make sure things are mined as ethically as possible. So those are decisions that might factor into how you buy. Um, another mm-hmm. thing that is going to be a really big factor is can you afford it? You know, is, is it worth maxing out a credit card for, you know, that one flawless ruby? I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, um, it depends, yeah. So um, there are a lot of factors that go into selecting the right stone for you. But, you know, ultimately, that's a very personal thing. When, when I do it myself, I kind of have these two warring factions in my head. I have the, like, mineral science, you know, collector part of me that wants the, the ideal specimen. But then the other part of me has to feel it out and find the perfect tool. And sometimes they're exactly the same stone. And other times I get it narrowed down to one of each and I go, holy crap, I have to pick one. I, I'm only taking one home. Which one is it going to be? Mm. And it's almost never the mineral science part of me that wins. It's it's almost always <laughs> the, the the energy side that chooses it. Yeah. Well, that's stronger. That truly is, and that that's you know, trust your gut. Listen to the voice in your head. Absolutely. You know, sometimes logic is okay, but mm-hmm. yeah. All right, um, we're going to take a break so everybody can like. Get a two-minute stretch and everything, and we will be back very shortly. Steering the Cauldron will be right back, so don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. warned, warned. Hey there. I don't know if you've heard, but there's a great new radio show on Para-X. Two hosts, one hour, and too much fun. Stephanie and Heidi not only talk about the latest goings-on in the supernatural worlds, they live it. They want to hear from you. They want to help you understand and guide you. And they want you to tune in. So, grab a friend or come alone to gather around that metaphysical table with Heidi and Stephanie. If you're interested in the worlds of the unseen, tune in to The Gathering Radio Show, Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on Para-X Radio. so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock for Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. We're back with Nicholas Pearson, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about maybe choosing, cleansing, dedicating, consecrating, and all that good stuff with, with stones. Um, so let, let's, you know, because some people say, okay, run run things through sea salt to cleanse them. And when that happens, um, you can scratch some, and you don't want to do that kind of thing. Um, so let, let's do a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, sometimes when we are not as educated in mineral science as we could be, we make some decisions that are not great for our stones. Uh, It's unfortunate we've all been there. I have certainly scratched or otherwise marred more than one rock in my life. Uh, Hopefully it won't happen again soon. Um, But there's so many different cleansing methods. You know, we've got sunlight and moonlight and, you know, anointing with holy water and oil and flower essences and gemstone elixirs. And you can use smoke from your favorite cleansing plants. You can do sea salt. You could bury things in the earth. People, you know, put them in plants. The the options are endless. So um, ultimately, we want to try to use things that are not very invasive. Um, you know, if we put something like a, a beautiful violet piece of fluorite out in full sun, it's not going to stay very violet for very long. Mm. If I take my most favorite piece of selenite and I bury it in salt, um, it's going to be scratched to high heavens. Um, if I take a beautiful piece of halite and I put it under running water, I will have very salty water and no more halite. Oh, so uh, um, <laughs> it helps to know a, a, just just a little bit of mineral science to know which things are safe for which methods. Uh, the good news is there are some methods that are available for us th- to use on any stone we want. Something like smoke for the most part. Uh, right. Using the breath. If something is too delicate to breathe upon, we're not using it in our healing practice. It's definitely not going in the pocket. Um, mm-hmm. We can we can do some really passive methods that 
that are going to be good for taking care of the energy of our stones so we can practice some good spiritual hygiene without necessarily damaging them. Mm -hmm. Just be thoughtful about doing it. And and in any of your books, I think you do talk about it. So if you know, people are forgetting what you say now. Get the book. Read it. Uh, it's, it's good. <laughs> now, dedicating and consecrating. People say, what? What is, what is that all about? So you can tell us what it's all about. Sure. You know, when I was first starting my crystal journey, um, at the time, it was a lot easier to find books on crystal healing that were published in the UK and then, you know, distributed here in North America rather than the other way around. And, um, you know, one of the steps that I saw in a lot of these English books um, was the idea of dedication. And the, the trend has not entirely phased out, but I see less and less of it, especially with books that are published by authors here in North America. Um, you know, dedication is kind of like inviting your stone to be used only for works of the highest good. So they're mm-hmm. dedicated to something sacred rather than profane. They're here to help rather than harm. And it's right. like building in a failsafe. Because, I mean, let's face it, not every crystal is a gentle healer, a gentle teacher. Um, Sometimes we need a little bit more confrontational energy. And um, if we have something that is dedicated to do no harm, then it will will do nothing rather than cause harm. And so I think it's a really really simple but beautiful thing to do whenever we get new stones, whether we dedicate each one individually or kind of do them in a big batch. Mm -hmm. It helps it helps us just set the standard that we want to honor them and we want them to honor us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know what, when, when we talk about empowering the stones, people go, Whoa, you mean I have power over those stones? I can, you know, make them do what I want them to do. Um, But, but you know, there's another part to that too. You can only go so far because I think each stone has its own properties that, are singular to it you know i mean you can't get the same thing out of a moonstone that you could get out of um quartz maybe or a right. bad bad connection but you know what i mean yeah. so so how much can we empower and how would we go about it so um you know we hear a lot of terms like charging crystals and programming crystals empowering crystals and i think for the most part they they have a lot of um mutual use but there there are some words that i think can give us some connotations like when someone says they're charging their crystal but they don't have a specific goal or idea in mind it's like they're plugging in their smartphone you know trying to up the battery but um, if we could deplete the actual energy in the bonds that make the crystal lattice then the crystal would cease to exist so it doesn't really require charging in that sense you know placing it out under moonlight doesn't magically increase its battery power um Mm -hmm. So um, I like to use terms like programming and powering instead because they remind us of what the goal of this is. Um, you know, programming is a very new agey term that's definitely influenced by the, the computer age and it's the idea that we're instilling a program or an intention into our crystal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like, I like using the word empowering because um, it means that we are imbuing that object or that tool with a magical goal. It is more of an act of co-creation. It's more an invitation than it is a mandate. And if we use mm-hmm. terms like programming, then um, you know we're we're installing a program, and that's what the crystal is going to do. But um, you know, I think I think it's really got to be more of a partnership. We can't say that we are the almighty, powerful human beings, and all of creation must bow down to us. Um, historically, that hasn't turned out so well for us. <laughs> so yeah. if we instead try to have a more harmonious partnership with our crystals then you know when we pick up our piece of rhodonite and say hey you know what rhodonite um you're such a great ally for me whenever i experience a lot of change or anxiety or stress i really love to work on transforming those patterns since i have a whole lot on my schedule now rhodonite is going to come right up to you and say all right let's do it i'm on this maybe it won't say that in english or whatever language you speak (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you know energetically that's generally the sense that we get Um, And I think that it's probably the most vital, after cleansing, it is the most vital part of working with our stones. Yeah, I agree. Now, one thing I also want to bring up are crystal elixirs um, and essences, because people may not have heard of them or how to make them or why even 
So um, I think this would be a good time to talk about that because it looks really, really interesting to me. You know, the idea of taking crystal energy and using that to charge our water in some way is a, a very, very old one. All we have to do is you know, look into um, the archaeological record and we see lots of containers made out of gemstones that were used for you know, water and oil and wine and lots of other things. So the idea here is that with our stones, we can kind of create a, a almost like a potion, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's definitely a, a science to it. Um, you know, Marcel Vogel, who was a research scientist with IBM for 27 years, he was the, um, the grandfather of all liquid crystal systems research, um, mm-hmm. invented the first LCDs, in fact. Um, mm-hmm. He studied the influence of um, liquid crystal mesophase, the the state of being in between liquidity and crystallinity, and how consciousness and and quartz in particular can influence the arrangement of the um, molecules in water. So we know that there is definitely a, a, a measurable scientific component to it, but that kind of takes all the magic out of things if that's all we focus on. So um, you know, when we create our elixirs, we can have that real kind of clinical, technical aspect, but we can also look to make things a little bit more magical. So crystals, el- crystal elixirs and essences um, can be made with any number of stones and any number of liquids. I, I mean, honestly, you could make an elixir out of your apple juice if you wanted. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are a couple caveats. One, we, again, have to know a little bit about mineral science. Um, you really don't want to put something like cerusite or galena or um, plumbogamite in your in your drinking water because they're lead-based minerals and we sure don't want any lead to come out Um, Mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we're not going to put something in that will splinter and fall apart because we don't want to ingest those splinters Mm -hmm. um you know when in doubt leave it out there are indirect methods for making elixirs um and you can read about safe ways to do that in the book you might make a crystal grid around your drinking water you might um place the stone inside a smaller to keep that dry and keep that smaller in container inside a bowl of water so there's that barrier of air mm-hmm. and glass between the stone and the liquid you might ingest um, but in addition to things that we could use internally we can also make um, like anointing oils that yeah. have crystals and other ingredients um, to use for ritual use and so there are going to be a whole bunch of recipes in the book that give you mm-hmm. some some guidelines for doing that. And of course, like any recipe book, I'm, I'm really hoping people will read and customize and make them their own. Mm-hmm. Yep. A little pinch of that and a little pinch of your own. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> now you also have something um, about charm bags. Um, charm bags like a cleaning, ch- cleansing charm bag or wealth pouch or something. That's Now that's something... I didn't really think about it. I mean, the only crystals that I have in bags are, are sitting with my tarot cards or my oracle deck. Um, but it, it's just like making a little mojo bag out of, of crystals and minerals, yeah? Absolutely. And, you know, um, the idea of using stones in this way is a, not at all recent. Um, when we look, I mean, historically, we have talismanic gemstones that date back millennia. So um, I wanted to have a few, a few options for working with crystals that were not at all like my other books, things that felt a little bit witchier. Um, mm-hmm. So you're going to find, you know, those, those charm bags or mojo bags or grigri bags or spell pouches or any number of other fun words you want to use to describe them. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking at something that I missed in the book and I'm, I just, it's, it caught me and it's wonderful. It's using stones to make like Bridget's cross. And you've got this lovely picture. You know, you make the grid with certain stones and it looks like there's quartz crystals as the square. And I'm not sure what some of the other ones are in the picture. But, you know, you instead of carrying it around, I mean, it, it's beautiful. How do you then, in, rather than me reading it, all right, so I'm looking at this picture of the grid <laughs> of Bridget's cross. Now, do you wire them together do you make a a a pendant out of them i mean you don't just sit there and let them look on pretty on the table so is it more like creating some kind of a jewel in a sense i suppose 
I suppose you really could. That that actually hadn't occurred to me. Um, these are meant to be crystal grids that you might use for uh, meditation or as maybe a, a focal point on your altar. And think of them kind of like the beautiful sand mandala paintings that mm. the Tibetan Buddhist monks do. They're impermanent. They're, they're actually exercises in okay. impermanence. So when it comes to a crystal grid, of course you can make a grid that you're going to keep up permanently, but chances are if you're really in tune with the energy of that grid, it's going to evolve over time. Stones are going to come out and go in and move around because your life is going to change, and so those grids become a reflection of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to have some real fun and goddess-themed crystal grids. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple other nice books out there that talk about crystals in, in magic and spellcraft, and there are some magically inspired crystals crystal grids in them but i wanted a handful that were just related to goddesses so there's one for you know bridget's cross you're gonna find one that's shaped like a cauldron there's i'm a looking Venus at that thread. one right now <laughs> yeah how appropriate right yeah um, and that one's real simple it's just some obsidian and quartz um, mm -hmm. and even even the the um, lack of crystallinity that obsidian has kind of represents that primal void, that cauldron of creation, the cauldron of chaos out of which all things are born. So um, it's not just the shape that becomes symbolic when we make crystal grids, but the stones we include in them have a profound amount of symbolism if we allow them to. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have like um, little incantations, at, uh, some of them, not all, of, well, yeah, pretty much all of them. Um, which is really neat as well, because um, that just gives them their their power, their strength. But there, I mean, there's spiral grids. There's you know triple goddess grids. I mean, it's it's just amazing the stuff in this book. I mean, everything that there's so many rituals and um, spells in addition to the you know, limitless number of ones in the back. I mean, you talk about casting a circle and, and creating sacred space. I mean, you, you've covered all the basics. So even somebody that, that's just new to the craft or something can read this and, and pick up on it and, and know what to do. Yeah, that was really one of the the guiding factors in doing this because none of my other books really talk about crystals from that more magical perspective. I needed to have a working book that covered all the basics mm -hmm. and it allowed me to kind of revisit my early days in the craft and like when I was first developing a relationship with with the idea of of goddess and um, that's where a lot of this comes from. So I'm, I'm really grateful that I, I got the opportunity to do a lot of this. And so I, I wrote my own circle casting, my own um, quarter calls that are based on the symbolism of stones. Mm -hmm. You've done a, just a marvelous job. It's it just mind-boggling. And some of these stones I've not seen. Um, really, the pictures, that, that, this is the other thing that I've got to mention. The pages are the nice, smooth pages. The pictures are just as beautiful as anything, and there are many. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's almost like, this is really trite, but it's almost like a coffee table book in the sense that you can pick it up and you can read, but you can also flip through and look at some very beautiful pictures. Um, did you take all of these, or did you find them... In here and there? Um, so my partner is a photographer, and he's worked oh. with me for every one of my books. Nice. And for this one, we made the decision that we had to have more interesting photos. One, you know, as an artist, he needs something that's more exciting than a rock on a black background, or uh -huh. a white background, as the case right. may be. Yeah. Um, and then the this book is not just like an exercise in research writing it was not just you know which stones do i connect to the divine feminine but really it was um an act of devotion every time i sat down to write every time that i got a chance to work on the editing um thanks to some some kind and insightful words from my my friend and colleague uh dan lupacino um mm -hmm. he suggested that I, I turn those things into devotional acts to the goddess herself so uh -huh. even the pictures became acts of devotion so we tried to make yeah. them look like they might be um you know altar setups or grids or spells in motion or meditation focal points so they tell a story in some way and, and sometimes because that's a very labor intensive process they're just beautiful for the sake of being beautiful that's okay <laughs> You know, you look at the green garnet, it's just a great photo of a green garnet, mm -hmm. not a whole lot of other frills going on. 
Um, yeah. But then you look at something like the red garnet, and I mean, it's sitting there nestled among the, the pomegranate arils, and you really get an idea of the story that I'm going to tell about mm-hmm. garnets and pomegranates and, and maybe a goddess called Persephone. Yeah, and the geodes here have a nice ribbon wrapped around them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's very clever, really, mm-hmm. really nice. Um, I've got a question from the chat room, and I, I it's going to be hard for you to answer, I'm sure, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, she wants to know, what is your favorite crystal and why? So usually I have a very clear-cut answer for this. Um, <laughs> and that, that stone is Peter Zeit, and it always will be. But since we're talking about stones of the goddess, why don't we talk about one of my favorite goddess-oriented stones? Okay. Um, and we'll focus on the why of that. Yeah. Um, you know, out of, out of all the stones in the book, I think the one that has been the most continually supportive to me on my personal journey is Lapis Lazuli. It has some of the richest goddess-related symbolism. Um, I, I wrote a lot about it in, well, so far, all, all of my other books. Um, it's one of the few stones that, that even crept its way into my book on Reiki. There's a, a tiny little reference if you read real carefully. Um, but, um, you know, Lapis has been associated with goddesses like Isis, Inanna, Ishtar, even um, Mary, Mother of Christ. It's connected to um, Mat to Eresh Kigal, uh, there's just this profound depth of symbolism that's connected to Lapis, and um, it is a, an amazing teacher. Lapis has really humble origins. It starts out as the sediments on the bottom of the sea, and through the process of metamorphosis, of orogenesis, the thing that makes mountains form, um, mm-hmm. those, those sediments become limestone, and they get subjected to heat and pressure, and they borrow minerals from rocks around them when they're combined with other rocks and they you know, eventually thrust up into the sky and that heat and pressure that that accompanies them on their skyward journey takes them from this really boring stone to something as beautiful as lapis lazuli where it becomes that royal blue color and it mm-hmm. represents that idea of the the stellar goddess the, the goddess of the sky the queen of heaven and it's got this energy of sovereignty of vision of truth um, and i think it can be a really wonderful stone for accessing those ideals in a time when we are fraught with change and uncertainty. Wouldn't we all love to have a little sense of empowerment and sovereignty in our lives? You bet. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an understatement, I think, in, these, in this day and age. So do you have a particular stone that can slow down time? Because every week I struggle with the hour going by too quickly. <laughs> well, you know, um, maybe not one to slow down time, but one to bring you more fully into the, the awareness of time as it's moving. That could be calcite. Calcite is a really great ally in living in the present moment. It is at once spontaneous and not really concerned with the passage of time. But at the same time, it, it allows us to just know that we're here in the now and whatever time we've got, we've got. I love that stone. <laughs> Now, before we do run out of time, and we are getting kind of close, I um, want to have you tell everybody about your website, first and foremost, um, because that's where they can find just about all the books and everything else about it. But then I want you to talk a little bit about your personalized crystal consultations and even maybe, which we probably don't have a lot of time lately to do this, but your remote Reiki sessions. So let's, let's get those in. Sure. So, um, you know, you can reach out to me via my website, www.theluminouspearl.com. Um, and you can read all about what a luminous pearl is in Stones of the Goddess. It's the last crystal in the compendium. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of services I offer in addition to writing books and teaching workshops. Um, I'm a really avid Reiki practitioner. I'm happy to do consultations um, to help people find the ideal stone ally in their lives. Um, so, um, you know, there'll be some basic information on the website about that, but those are on a, an, you know, as, as I have time available, I'm happy to offer those services. So, yeah. you know, you've got specific things going on in your life. You maybe want some distant Reiki to support that or want to help, want help finding the ideal mix of stones, just reach out. And what benefit do, do people have when they get that personalized, um, mix of stones for them? What, how does that work? For them, and, and how do you choose that? I mean, certain basic questions? You know, it, it's going to be a, a mix of asking the right questions 
and listening to the answers. And then the other part of it is going to be asking the stones and listening for their answers. Um, so no two consultations are alike. Um, you know, I'm happy to help you source them, but, um, you know, first and foremost, the consultation is just to get you going in the right direction on where to look for the right stones for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's exciting stuff. I mean, it's different. Everybody can say, well, okay, do you do readings? Do you do this or that? But I mean, who gets personal, um, crystal consultations? I mean, that's kind of nice. (laughs) That's way different because, you know, it can help you do whatever you need to do and, 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 um, in a very, beautiful way actually so i i really need to thank you um again there was just so much i I mean i wish this was a a, a video show because i want to hold this book up and show people how pretty it is you know i mean it really (laughs) really is nice and um and it's kind of um nice to be able to talk about it and not so nice that we kind of run out of time when we get going so good because there are just like a million things in there but you know I, I say this and I only say it when I really mean it but you know for any of anybody that's interested in, in crystals and stones and minerals this is the book to have in your library I mean there there's probably nothing that was overlooked and again no stone unturned yeah I know rub it in twice um, but you know it, it's just one of those things that you really need to get and um so please, you know, get the book. You won't be sorry. And I see somebody in chat already did. Oh, this is good. <laughs> there Yay. you go. Yay, exactly. All right. Well, again, thank you. Um, we're going to talk down the line and, and maybe be able to start talking about our project at some point. We'll do a show about that. Um, and as soon as we get the, the go-ahead from the upper class people that are holding us hostage for you know not being able to say anything but we'll do that um but in the meantime again thank you i know you're busy and and like you said you this is your third show in 24 hours and thank you for taking the time to do it because that can be really um dragging and tiring and and exhausting so i really do appreciate it oh it's my pleasure and as always thanks for having me on we always have the best chats Yes, we do. And um, I want to thank everybody else for listening in, too, because, you know, that's what we're here for. <laughs> and so until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more Cauldron Stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2019. The Mysterioso March by Kevin McLeod is licensed through incompotech.com.